Nature is made possible by public television stations. By Siemens, a leader in high technology electronics and electrical engineering. Nationwide, 27,000 Americans in 400 locations. The name is Siemens. And by your gas company and America's gas industry, bringing natural gas through a million miles of underground pipelines to 160 million people. This stunning sandstone monolith, rising 1,100 feet above the surrounding arid plain, is Ayers Rock. It stands at the very heart of the largest island on Earth, a flat continent of 3 million square miles, with a population that's less than the state of New York. It's also on the other side of the Earth. This is Australia. Hi, I'm George Page for Nature, and today we begin a series of six programs celebrating the strange and unique natural history of Australia. Understandably, the first European settlers were baffled by what they found here. Winters during our summers, trees shedding their bark instead of their leaves, mammals that lay eggs, and others that hop instead of run. In fact, they found a land where literally nature seemed to be turned upside down. The white man is a very recent arrival. The aboriginal people came at least 50,000 years earlier. They call this rock Uluru. For them, it's a sacred place, and it's where we start our exploration of the nature of Australia. The mighty kangaroo. There's no animal like it in the world. So strange that the first Europeans were tempted to believe it arose from a separate creation. Separate and different. The first white explorers found a land where almost nothing seemed to match their previous experience. Terra Australis, the Great South Land, nearly 2,500 miles across, stretching from the tropics to the edge of the Antarctic Sea. The very texture of the land seemed alien, ancient, worn, scoured to its very bones. Craters gouged by exploding meteorites deepened the sense of a harsher world. The endless, parched plains seemed hostile to Europeans from a green and gentle land.
They searched in vain for familiar plants, and the animals, of course, took strange and startling forms. Here, the inland rivers run mostly with sand. Water is precious, and a little has to go a long way. Yet it sustains an amazing assortment of life, much of it unique to this greatest of islands. A land often sun-scorched and ungiving, but also a place of startling extremes. In the far north, tropical monsoons flood the heat-baked plains every year, transforming them into rich and productive wetlands, vibrant with life. Almost everywhere, eucalypts dominate the landscape. The unique trees of Australia, masters of drought and fire. Their wispy green crowns shelter colorful parrots. And even more remarkable creatures. The koala and kangaroo, symbols of the special nature of Australia, led Europeans to question how this island continent came to be so different from the rest of the world. The answer lies in its different origins. Both koala and kangaroo arose from a line of evolution separate from other mammals, the marsupials, mammals which raise their young in pouches. The story of how the marsupials, and especially their most majestic form, the kangaroos, came to dominate Australia, traces the making of the continent itself and all the extraordinary life it carries. The sea played a crucial role. Australia is the way it is because it is an island. For millions of years, the encircling sea isolated the great south land from the rest of the world and kept outside influences at bay. But Australia wasn't always an island. Once it belonged to a primeval lost world. The evidence is exposed by the waves. Embedded in the rock lie fossilized remains of trees that formed part of a worldwide forest 250 million years ago. These trunks and leaves are part of primeval trees called Glossopteris. They and their world have long vanished. Identical fossil trees have turned up in Antarctica, South America, Africa and India. This commonly shared tree and our modern understanding of plate tectonics indicate all those continents were once joined, forming a great supercontinent, Gondwana. This was the shape of Gondwana 150 million years ago. Australia was 1,800 miles farther south than it is now. Even though it was close to the South Pole, there was no ice because the world was much warmer. 
Gondwanan Australia was a place of plentiful rain and luxuriant vegetation. There are still places in Australia which recall that lost world. In these mountain streams are remarkable living relics, mammals even stranger than marsupials. The platypus, one of only three members of an ancient order to live into the present day. It's a creature so bizarre that zoologists thought the first specimen to reach Europe was a hoax, sewn together from bits of other animals. But oddity is in the eye of the beholder. The platypus is very well designed for life in the water. It's warm-blooded, has fur and webbed feet for swimming, and the most intriguing feature is that duck-like bill. But the bill resembles a duck's only in appearance. With eyes, ears, and nostrils closed underwater, the bill has become an amazingly sophisticated sense organ, an acutely sensitive shovel that homes in on the minute electric currents emanating from the muscles of worms and grubs hiding in the gravel. The catch is stored in cheek pouches, ground up by horny plates instead of teeth, and swallowed. The oily, waterproof fur traps a layer of air to insulate the platypus in water that drops to close to freezing in winter. Platypuses normally live alone, though several may forage along the same stretch of river they keep out of each other's way. But come breeding time in early spring, they go courting, and it's the female that takes the initiative. The two circle one another, stroking and nuzzling with that most sensitive of organs, the bill. The female has to be careful not to provoke the male, for he has a poisonous spur on each hind leg, though it's a weapon more likely to be wielded against other males in the struggle for breeding rights. In courtship, touching and petting lead to mutual trust and allow the pair to mate. They'll mate often in the next few weeks, each encounter accompanied by its ritual of play and caresses. Once she's pregnant, the female retires to a chamber that she's burrowed deep into a riverbank. Here, in a nest of damp leaves, she awaits the arrival of her young. The platypus is unique, but not alone. It has one living relative, the echidnas, or spiny anteaters. Echidnas and platypuses are monotremes, the only surviving representatives of the first true mammals. 
The echidna's ancestry also goes back to the forests of Gondwana. Two kinds survive today. This long-beaked one snuffles for worms and insects in the forest litter, sucking them up through its long snout. Its shorter-nosed and even spinier relative has strong claws to break open rotting wood and a long tongue to lick up termites and ants. Females need to stock up on food when the time nears to have their young. But in having young, they are like no other mammals in the world. The platypus and the echidnas astounded science when it was discovered that instead of giving birth to babies, they actually lay eggs. The echidna lays her single egg into a pouch. The embryo is already well developed and hatches in only 10 days. The baby echidna's first move is to find milk, the essential food for all young mammals. But these egg-laying mammals have no nipples. Instead, the baby prods a patch of skin inside the pouch, stimulating the milk to ooze out through special pores. It might seem a messy way to suckle, but the tiny mouth at the end of the snout sucks up the liquid quite effectively, and the infant increases its weight a hundredfold in the first three weeks. Though still naked, the shapeless bundle soon grows into the likeness of its parent. When the spines do grow, the youngster, understandably, is ejected from the pouch. But mother continues to suckle it for another five months. Only then does the young echidna leave the burrow for good. The monotremes are part of Australia's Gondwanan heritage. The rest of their line has vanished. And 100 million years ago, other mammals began to develop whose descendants would come to dominate Australia. Those ancestral mammals looked much like the brush-tailed Fascogal, small, furry, and warm-blooded to hunt in the cool of the night. The daylight hours still belong to reptiles, which needed the sun's warmth to function. Most spectacular were the dinosaurs, ruling Australia for 100 million years. Most were plant eaters, feeding on ferns and other primitive vegetation. But great change was about to overtake this primordial world and set the stage for the decline of reptiles and the rise of mammals. Immense forces pull the plates of the Earth's crust apart, splitting the continents, reshaping the seas, creating new environments. Gondwana was breaking up. The world was growing colder. The ancient forests gave way to a fundamentally different vegetation, the flowering plants. And it led to a fundamental shift in animal life too. 
by 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs had all but vanished and the mammals were on the march. Flowers offered nectar, attracting pollinators, the insects. As the flowering plants spread, insect life burgeoned and the mammals that fed on them prospered. Some mammals no longer produced eggs like echidnas and platypuses, but gave birth to babies. One group adopted very short pregnancies. Babies were born only partially formed and completed their development on their mother's nipples. These were the marsupials. From small primitive beasts like these arose a remarkable range of marsupials with diverse ways of feeding and breeding. One feature evolved among several marsupial lines, a pouch to enclose and protect the young growing on their nipples. While pregnancy is short, a mere 12 days among these bandicoots, the young need to be suckled for a relatively long time. It'll be 70 days before they're weaned. Pouches evolved in many different shapes and sizes. Some opened forwards, some backwards. In predators like this cat-like quoll, it's no more than a fold of skin but the youngsters are firmly clamped to the nipples. Their very existence depends on their ability to hang on. They're already lucky to be alive. Their mother gave birth to almost 30 young, but she has only six nipples. The others lost out in the race to secure nourishment. Later, when they're nearly full grown, the young quals continue to cling to mother. They hitch a ride as best they can while she goes hunting through the undergrowth at night. It's a good way of learning a bit of hunting technique. And there's a meal at the end. The quals evolved from tiny insect eaters. Their forebears were among the many pouched mammals which spread out to exploit the changing environment of Gondwana. The marsupials reached Australia through the forests that stretched across the supercontinent, but they probably first emerged somewhere in the Americas. By 50 million years ago, Africa and India had split off, leaving only Australia, Antarctica, and South America still united in Gondwana. And it's in South America that we find the first clues to the evolution of Australia's marsupials. The Andes arose long after Gondwana split up, but in their shadow, traces of the ancient supercontinent still linger. The great mountains are flanked by forests of southern beech, among the earliest flowering plants and almost identical to those that survive in Australia. And when night falls, an even more significant link with the past emerges. Dromiceops australis, the closest living relative to the ancestor of all the Australian marsupials. It's the size of a mouse and feeds on insects, as its earliest ancestors did.
As Dromisiop's ancestors made their way to the Australian end of Gondwana, marsupials continued to diversify in the South American section. Among the most successful were the opossums. Eighty species live on today. Some forage on the ground, others, like the mouse opossum, roam up in the trees. One opossum even took to water in search of prey. The yapok is the only marsupial to adopt an amphibious way of life, the marsupial equivalent of the platypus. The yapok is well equipped for its special existence. Its hind feet are webbed to generate swimming power. And the tips of its forepaws are enlarged into sensitive pads to feel for prey. Underwater, the pouch could be a disadvantage. Water could get in and drown the babies. But fatty secretions around the lip seal it into a watertight chamber. Once underwater, those sensitive fingers do their work. The eyes are closed, and the yapok finds its food entirely by touch. As marsupials were spreading across Gondwana, a new kind of mammal was developing in the north. Placental or eutherian mammals, giving birth to well-developed babies, moved south and began to replace the marsupials of South America. It's still not known why. Marsupials were never to regain their prominence here and had reached a critical turning point in their history. But once more, geological forces intervened. Fifty million years ago, Australia broke away from Gondwana and drifted north with its founding company of ancestral marsupials. No eutherian mammals had reached the Australian end of Gondwana, and in isolation, marsupials evolved into an astounding range of creatures. There were enormous beasts the size of oxen that browsed on shrubs and low trees, the largest marsupials that ever lived. Others had long pendulous trunks to reach higher branches. And with such an abundance of prey, there were predators. The largest and most ferocious was Thylacoleo, a killer possum the size of a panther. Some pouched hunters were more wolf-like. The last thylacines, or Tasmanian wolves, were still marauding through the forests of Tasmania until just 50 years ago. The largest of the recent marsupial carnivores, thylacines had a powerful leap, catching prey by stealth rather than the chase. Once there was a whole range of these marsupial wolves, as there was of this ferocious little creature. The Tasmanian Devil the sole relic of a large company of beasts that fed almost exclusively on carrion. The devils hark back to the great age of marsupial predators.
15 million years ago, their ancestors feasted on a vast array of prey, from bandicoots to the many animals which evolved to feed on plants. The earliest plant-eating marsupials lived up in the trees. The spotted cuscus still does today in the northern forests. The cuscuses remain tree dwellers, but some of their distant forebears descended from the trees to take up life on the ground. And from those primitive possums emerged the most distinctive marsupial of all, the kangaroo. How the first move out of the trees might have happened is revealed by the brush-tailed possum. It feeds in the canopy, but also browses on the forest floor. To keep its balance on the branches, it moves with a bounding gait, and here may well be the genesis of the kangaroo hop. Bounding proved to be an effective way of getting around and of avoiding predators. Some of those early venturers stayed on the ground. The musky rat kangaroo represents those first ground dwellers, a living portrait of the founder of the entire kangaroo family. With locomotion delegated largely to the hind legs, the front paws became hands to manipulate plants, fallen fruits, and seeds. This tiny kangaroo lives alone. Its nutritious foods are widely scattered and best collected away from competition. It often buries leftovers, squirreling them away for times when food might run short. But while there were new opportunities on the ground, there were also new dangers. And the early kangaroos, like this rufous betong, learned to build nests to hide from their enemies. The prehensile tail, so useful for hanging onto branches up in the trees, now made a handy carrier for nesting material. The tail also came to serve as a counterbalance. With stronger hind legs and longer feet, bounding became true hopping. Though betongs are solitary animals, they do need to get together to breed, and they do so very cautiously. Males and females are equal in size and strength, and his attempts to woo her are extremely tentative. His hind leg shields him while he gets his nose close enough to check by her smell whether she's ready to mate. Among these tree kangaroos, males have to compete with each other for mating rights and grow much more powerful than females. The large bucks smear their scent liberally around the terrain. Glands on the chest secrete a forceful chemical message that spells out his size and power, a message that tells other males he's around and not to be tampered with.
These kangaroos live in loose social groups, with males often coming into conflict. Size and strength win out in the struggle for dominance. Free kangaroos are something of an evolutionary oddity. They used to live on the ground, but somewhere in the past they returned to the canopy to take advantage of the abundant leaves. They've become readapted to life in the treetops, with short, broad feet padded to prevent slipping and powerful arms with long, sharp claws to grip trunks and branches. Tree kangaroos range throughout the rainforests that once covered Australia, but now they're found only in a few patches in the far north and New Guinea. While these odd creatures remained out on an evolutionary limb of their own, the main stem of the kangaroo family was sent branching in new directions by dramatic changes which overtook Australia 10 to 15 million years ago. Australia's increasingly drier climate was altering its environment. Rainforests gave way to open woods and grasslands. These changes prepared the stage for the rapid expansion of the kangaroos. As well as browsing on the leaves of trees and shrubs, some wallabies began eating the coarser grasses. As they moved into the grasslands, they carried with them the miracle of marsupial birth. That most extraordinary process is signaled by a tamar wallaby licking her pouch. The birth is only the start of an arduous journey. Before it's even clawed its way free of the membrane, the young responds to gravity, resisting its pull, heading upwards towards the pouch. The licking is not so much to clean a path as to keep the way moist and prevent this tiny creature from drying out. That's all the help it gets from its mother. The baby is only fingertip size, but its forearms and claws are well developed and strong enough to haul it up through the jungle of its mother's fur. Its chest and lungs, too, are already quite large to gulp in vital air on the long climb. Once it reaches the lip of the pouch, it's probably scent that guides the little creature deep inside. To one of the four nipples. Its tiny jaws clamp onto the nipple, which then expands inside the mouth, locking the youngster firmly in place.
The composition of the milk changes to match the baby's growing needs, becoming steadily richer in fats and proteins. But there's a grimmer option too. If conditions turn bad, the flow of milk stops and the baby dies, saving the mother's resources. Full term in the pouch lasts nearly six months. Then the baby has its second birth into the world outside. These first excursions are quite brief. The pouch will be home for some months yet. Pouches are put to good advantage in Australia's unpredictable environment. They're convenient baby carriers while parents search for better pastures. With a flexible means of reproduction and an efficient means of travel, the kangaroos were set to advance with the spreading grasslands. The powerful hind legs work like efficient springs, and the strong hopping motion pumps air in and out of the lungs, saving on muscle effort. With the move from forest browsing to grazing in the open, kangaroos, like these eastern greys, became more social. Such quantities of easy food diminish the need to keep out of each other's way, and there are more eyes to spot danger. As the Australian climate grew drier, grass became more abundant, but it's hard on the teeth and difficult to digest. Kangaroo teeth grew stronger to grind the tough fibers, and their large stomachs acquired special microbes to break down the grass into easily absorbed nutrients. Many species even developed a kind of cud chewing to help digestion. They cough up partially chewed food, then send it through the stomach once more. Living on the grasslands, kangaroo mothers became watchful parents. The open plain leaves the joey exposed to predatory eyes, especially those of wedge-tailed eagles. Mother holds it back until she's checked that there's no danger. Only when she's sure it's safe does she relax the pouch muscles to let her baby out? The joey keeps returning to the pouch, but mother won't let it back in yet because she's teaching it to come when she calls. When it obeys, she opens her arms and leans forward so that her pouch flops open. Gradually, the spells inside the pouch shorten,
grass increasingly replaces milk and the joey learns to groom and clean itself as it grows to independence. The bond between the young kangaroo and its mother remains strong for a time yet. But she has already given birth again, and the new baby's growing inside the pouch even while she's still nursing the youngster outside. Males are always on the lookout for does that may be in season, ever ready to follow the sexual trail. Bucks try to mate with as many females as they can, but the most powerful male, the King Grey, claims exclusive mating rights, and he's ever alert for a challenge. By scratching her tail, this male interloper finds out if she's receptive, but it's a very provocative act, not one the dominant male can afford to ignore. The approach of the King Grey is enough to deter the interloper. He moves into the background when the King arrives to assert his rights. The smell of the doe's urine tells him that she's almost ready to mate. But she'll only remain receptive for a few hours, and he covers her with scent from his chest gland to warn off other males. Again, that inquisitive tail scratching, a kind of foreplay. This time, she remains still, a sign that she's ready for him to mount. Remarkably, the fertilized egg doesn't grow to full term immediately, but stops at the 100 cell stage and becomes dormant. It won't resume growing until the present youngster is finished nursing. Right now, there's an interruption. The interloper decides that this is the time to launch his challenge. The female runs off. The challenger goes after her. with the king in hot pursuit to reclaim his authority. The king gray paws and rubs at a clump of grass as a warning, a ritualized deployment of scent. Then a show of power. Rearing six feet high, mighty arms tipped with sharp claws, an intimidating sight and normally enough to make rivals turn tail. But this challenger is of equal size and not about to be faced down. Life at the top is precarious and short. King greys are under constant challenge and defending their status eventually wears them out.
The dominant buck looks away, a last attempt to avoid battle. It fails. The aim is to overpower by whatever means it takes. Paws and legs swing into action. The hind claws are sharp enough to disembowel, but in defense, the belly skin is tough like a shield. To minimize injury, the testicles are retracted and the heads thrown back to protect the eyes. A year of fending off rivals has taken the edge off the King Grey's stamina. This time, he may be staring defeat in the face. The raking nails on the hind feet send the fur flying. Each seeks the advantage of higher ground. Finally, it's the challenger who positions himself for the decisive blow. And that's it. The battle is won, the challenger is king. But for the loser, there's no mercy. He's banished to the poorest feeding grounds. Worn out by the stress of battle, he may well die. Win or lose, such a fight takes a terrible toll. But for the victor, the rewards are great. It's taken him 10 years to reach the top. And although he may reign for only a year, he'll have nearly all the matings and a legacy of numerous young to inherit his winning strength. These titanic battles arose out of the way the lives of kangaroos changed with the nature of Australia. Part of the new pattern that saw these majestic marsupials extend their dominion right into the arid interior. This parched and scoured country is the realm of the largest living marsupials, the red kangaroos. These splendid animals became superbly tuned to the swings between long drought and brief plenty. The triumphant climax of a line that began with a tiny animal chasing insects around the forests of Gondwana 100 million years ago. Isolation shaped these unique symbols of Australia. An isolation created by the great oceans under the Tropic of Capricorn. In our next program, we'll explore the seas that surround this island continent. 
and the rich marine life they contain. From the magnificent humpback whales to the tiny creatures that together make up one of Australia's most impressive natural treasures, the Great Barrier Reef. I'm George Page. Nature is made possible by public television stations, your gas company, and the gas industry, meeting America's future energy needs by providing abundant supplies of clean natural gas for this generation and for generations to come. And by Siemens, a leader in electronics and electrical engineering. 27,000 employees, 47 manufacturing facilities. The name is Siemens. John Vandenveld has written a companion book to the nature of Australia, published by Facts on File. It is available in bookstores and libraries. The Nature of Australia examines species found only in Australia and nowhere else on Earth. This wildlife reflects Australia's isolation and geographic diversity, coastal reefs and rainforests, inland bush and desert. The Nature of Australia is available as a box video set. You may order the complete six-part television series on three long playing video cassettes for $49.95. For credit card orders, please call 1-800-451-7020.